Welcome to the Mudisa Network. Many people around the world believe that democracy is the best possible system to deliver better quality life for all its citizens. But it takes much more than that as experienced, particularly here in South Africa. The same has happened elsewhere in the world. I'm going to explore the main factors that influence whether nations fail or prosper and the role of culture, politics and public morality in the performance of national and global economies. The well-known author of the book, The End of History, Professor Francis Fukuyama, is my guest to help me go through those issues. Talking about culture, education is an important part of the development of citizens, but a recently published working paper by the International Monetary Fund has found that South Africa has been disappointing in providing meaningful education to our children and youth. The report suggests that the state of education may be responsible for the low productivity and entrenched poverty that we see in the country. Later, I will be joined by Elijah Mshanga of the Department of Basic Education and Gregory Masondo from Naptosa. But I start with my guest, the highly respected academic and author, Professor Francis Fukuyama. And thanks for visiting South Africa, especially at this time, Prof. And uh, I guess a good starting point for our conversation is on the back of your latest book, Identity, the Demand for Recognition and the Rise of Resentment. Where is the world at this time, based on you know, your findings and what you're sharing in the book? I think that we are in the midst of a global crisis for democracy because not only do you have powerful authoritarian countries like Russia and China that are challenging uh, democracy geopolitically, but you've had the rise of populist movements uh, in many uh, existing democracies, beginning with Britain and the United States that voted for Brexit and for Donald Trump respectively in 2016. Uh, I think these populist movements are challenging. They're driven by fears of immigration uh, and they I think are threatening to upset the international order that's been created over the last 70 years. But one would say or think that you know this was likely was to be the outcome of democracy after all that you have a diversity of voices and these voices want to be heard so that's what democracy exists for isn't it? Well that's true I think that uh, people have a right to express their views. The problem is that when you get a charismatic populist leader, a lot of times they want to undermine the other institutions of democracy, not just elections, but courts and the media uh, that is, has difficulty retaining its independence, sometimes in the face of uh, a president like Donald Trump that says the media is the enemy of the American people. Uh, so I think that's really the, cha uh, the, the, the challenge is to preserve a, a constitutional order, a, a respect for the rule of law uh, in the face of this kind of popular movement. But we also have international organizations such as the United Nations uh, that were established to deal with global order as it were and uh, over time shared experiences between nations should help us come together to solve problems. Of course there are many. There are trade wars and there are real military conflicts in the Middle East and uh, in former Eastern, East, 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 Eastern Europe and uh, other parts of the world. So what is it that you think will make it hard or easier for the world to come together to deal with the emerging challenges? Well, an organization like the United Nations doesn't have ind any independent authority other than what's given it by the big powers, especially the five on the Security Council. And if you have one of those big five uh, that, like the United States, has decided it doesn't really want to deal with international organizations, that weakens it tremendously. If you have others like Russia and China that in assist on protecting their sovereignty and not uh, being willing to accept decisions that go against their what they see as their national interest, uh, it's not going to be an effective organization. And I think for that reason it's been largely paralyzed. You look at the climate, the Paris Climate Accords, uh, where we thought we had reached some kind of uh, agreement to deal with really a very, very pressing uh, climate change issue, uh, the United States simply dropped out of it after Trump was elected. So I think you really need the buy-in from powerful countries if any of these international organizations are going to work. There was a time in the world where 
as difficult as it was for the smaller states uh, uh, to operate because of the influence of the major political forces of the time, the Cold War that I'm talking about, that there was Soviet u influence on one side and the United States and European influence uh, on the other side, the bipolar world order, as it were. Do you think that post that the world has become much more complicated than it was then? I don't know that it's much more complicated. In some sense, people have to realize that during the Cold War, we were worried about global nuclear war, and I think that's not a real concern right now. Uh, it's become much more multipolar, and in a sense, you know, that may be a good thing. Power is more evenly distributed. Uh, you don't have either this bipolar order or you don't have the hegemony of the United States, which I think was not necessarily a good thing. And so, uh, in a way, we're reverting to a more natural multipolar world. But the problem is, I think we need rules. We need rules for international cooperation, and that has not been forthcoming in recent years. I'm asking, looking at the United States' influence, for instance, that in the past one would believe that the U.S. can impose its will on, let's say, a North Korea uh, type situation. It looks uh, like now the influence of the United States has waned somewhat, that mm -hmm. it cannot bring any influence to bear on a country such as North Korea on, on one hand, but it's also got to have influence in a situation such as that that is emerging in Venezuela. And of course, the Middle Eastern story is still going on where Israel is in the center of things. And then you go to uh, the Indian Peninsula, the Pakistan, Afghanistan situation. So the United mm -hmm. States has got to bring its influence all over the place to try and settle things down, but it seems to be incapable of doing that? Well, I think it was never capable in a certain sense. I think people have always overestimated how uh, influential the United States was, and I think the high watermark of that was the Iraq War in 2003, where the United States thought it could eliminate this dictator and bring democracy to that country, and it turned out to be a complete fiasco. We spent a trillion dollars uh, in costs associated with that. Many people were killed. Uh, and Iraq is still, you know, a very troubled place. And so I think that uh, the influence the United States has has always been the most effective when it's actually used in cooperation with other countries. The U.S. by itself, I, I don't think, is, is really going to establish world order. But the very fact that we live in a multipolar world now and there are so many challenges all over the world seems to be something that troubles a lot of American elites, isn't it, at this time, that they feel that there's no longer what one could call American influence for good, as mm -hmm. it was presumed to be good mm -hmm. even when it was not that good. Uh, and, 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 and on the back of that, on the basis of that, the thinking is that new powers such as China or Russia or BRICS or what, whatever organizations that come together may take over from the United States and become the world superpower. Well, I think there's really only one country uh, that's likely to do that, and that's China. Uh, I don't think that you know, other countries in the world are nearly influential enough to play that role, but China may have a larger economy than the United States in a few years. Some people say it already does. Uh, clearly, with its Belt and Road Initiative, it's been uh, spreading its influence, a uh, kind of soft power throughout the world. So that's really, I think, the central challenge in, in, in geopolitics is incorporating China into a new kind of system where the United States is no longer dominant. Give me your thoughts on what you think are the key drivers of China's development, and it has been a rapid rise to where mm -hmm. it is almost now the leading uh, uh, economic power in the world on, on one side, and also the way it goes about asserting its influence around the world compared to the United States. Well, it uh, has an economic model that's based on an authoritarian government and a partially marketized uh, uh, economy. Uh, and it's got a very competent government that's for, you know, overseeing very rapid growth over an extended period of time, more than a generation. Uh, I think the challenge is that its ambitions have grown as its power has grown. Uh, initially, it had a foreign policy that was very accommodating to other countries, but now it's doing things like building military bases, you know, all the way out to the Indian Ocean and militarizing parts of the South China Sea. And so I think that... Uh, this is one of the realities of, of geopolitics, that your ambitions expand as your power expands. So that's, I, I think, the challenge that China is going to pose. 
We're talking about China and uh, the form of government that they have that has been strong technocratically speaking and that is why they've been able to realize this development. Does it mean that democracy does not allow for such economic growth? And we can compare in this instance to India, for instance, which uh, you know, is a more democratic mm -hmm. country and is, leg is growing but lagging mm -hmm. behind, substantially mm -hmm. behind China. Well, I think that democracy is, in a way, less important than, than freedom, personal freedom. Uh, and I think that up till now, China has permitted its entrepreneurs and, you know, even intellectuals, academics, uh, the ability to think independently, you know, criticize the government. Unfortunately, uh, since the rise of Xi Jinping, that's been reversed, and China has become a much stricter uh, dictatorship. And one of the big um, challenges for the future will be can a country that doesn't allow personal freedom actually innovate because don't people need to be able to challenge authority to think differently if they're really going to create an economy that you know is continually expanding and i think that's uh, uh, my i have my doubts whether that's going to be possible uh, i don't think that strict dictatorships really are able to meet the challenges of creativity that that's required by true innovation and the status of Europe now with the UK pulling out of uh, the EU. And then once you've commented on Europe, I'd like you to give me a sense of what you think of the African Union mm -hmm. itself. Because Africans always ask this question, citizens across the continent, why is Africa lagging behind? Uh, about 10, 15 years ago, it was, this was declared the African century, but it looks like Africa has regressed. So. Mm -hmm. You know, in Europe, there are problems with the UK pulling mm -hmm. out of the EU arrangements. They've got their own challenges there. But the bigger problem for Africans is here on the continent. Well, to begin with the EU, I think the EU is going to survive Brexit just fine. I think Britain may not survive very well. Uh, I think that uh, the British people and the British government have been extraordinarily weak and divided in trying to figure out how to exit and um, it looks like you could have a chaotic exit that I think will be an economic uh, disaster. It's going to hurt Europe but it's going to hurt Britain uh, more uh, and that actually may strengthen the EU in the long run because any other country that's thinking of leaving like Italy is you know under a new populist government has threatened to do I think is going to say wait you know maybe this isn't such a good idea. Uh, I think that in Africa the problem with collective action really has to do with you know, in a way, the, the diversity and the internal barriers to cooperation. Uh, Europe was built around basically a, an expanding free trade zone that then deepened the economic connections. And one of the striking things about Africa is that there's too many internal barriers to, uh, you know, to commerce. Some of them are natural geographic ones. There isn't the infrastructure, you know, to promote intra-African trade. But a lot of them are political. I mean, there are too many uh, differences in governance and regulation and tariffs and, and the like. Uh, so I think if Africa wants to really be a cohesive unit, it needs to take down those barriers, build the infrastructure that's needed uh, to facilitate, you know, greater markets and, and, and economic growth. And, and where do you think the influence on African affairs lies? Is it within Africa or I'm going back to the time of the, of the Cold War because mm -hmm. you know, countries could not cooperate on the basis of uh, the influence mm -hmm. that was brought to bear on them. Either a country fell under the American, European influence or the Soviet influence. Mm -hmm. Those things are no longer there. That's right. So what is influencing African Well, I, I think actually the biggest new player in Africa is China. I mean, China has been building infrastructure all over Africa. Uh, it has a lot of capital to invest. Uh, it has a lot of technical expertise. And Africa needs that infrastructure. It needs, it, it needs that kind of help. I think the challenge is... Uh, whether China will end up replacing the West as a kind of imperial power that's able to use its money and, and expertise to manipulate uh, uh, and, and, and change African institutions. I don't think that ultimately that's going to happen uh, because I think you know the fate of Africa is in the hands of Africans, but they have to know how to deal with a country like China. You know, the Chinese run a hard bargain. Uh, and if you're trying to negotiate with them a contract, uh, if you don't know what you're doing, you can easily be taken advantage of. And so it really is, you know, something that, that people have to be prepared uh, 
uh, for because it's it's sometimes an uneven contest with a big you know advanced technologically advanced power and and a much smaller weaker one well of course there are other influences in the world outside of governments uh, global capital technology and other issues being some of them and we'll pick on those in a moment my guest is uh, professor Francis Fukuyama He's currently visiting South Africa and uh, he's senior fellow at the Freeman Spalgi Institute. After the break, we'll pick up on those issues. Don't go away.